Hey, good morning, church. Would you guys stand with us? What a beautiful day to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let's sing out together. Let our praise be welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath, let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire.
Hosanna in the highest. We think of those people who cried that out on that day on Palm Sunday, um, but they were wanting to be saved from the Romans. How thankful we are that we cry Hosanna knowing that you've saved the world from its sins, that you are our savior and how thankful we are, Lord. I pray that we would just be basking in that goodness, Lord, that, that you've reached out to a sinless or sinful world and made us sinless, uh, righteous, declared righteous. Uh, before you, Lord. And even though we we're a work in progress, Lord, we're thankful that we can draw near on a Sunday morning, read your word that you've given us and let it transform and change us. Uh, use this time for your glory, for your purpose. Be honored in this place, we ask. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Wednesday night, we're gonna continue our study through the Gospel of John. And uh, why don't you turn there with me as we pull our text from our upcoming Wednesday night study. Uh, we'll go to John chapter four for today's study. John chapter four. Before we read this amazing, beautiful story in John chapter four, uh, I feel like we, we've got some work to do maybe on some history um, because it'll help us understand some of the nuances we might otherwise miss as we're reading John chapter four. And it has to do with the place called Samaria. What area, you say? Samaria, be more specific. No, it's literally Samaria. Um, that's, the place, <laughs> that's the place we're gonna talk about. The history of Samaria, I find it interesting. It's, qu it's quite a story, really, the Samaritan people. Um, and it starts way back, you know, remember when the children of Israel finally was free from slavery in Egypt? They made their way after a long wilderness wandering uh, and finally crossed the Jordan River, you know, from the east into the west to part of, and, and uh, took over the land of Canaan. And that all, you know, happened right around 1200 BC-ish. Um, when the Jews took the, the land of Canaan and the, the 12 tribes settled in that region. Of course, you know, the, the two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, they settled on the, the east side of the Jordan River. Bad idea, by the way. But um, the other half of Manasseh and Ephraim, they settled in the middle part of Israel and all the other tribes uh, kind of scattered in Israel. But the reason this is important is that the two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, that region would eventually become known as the region of Samaria. And, uh, and there's a story behind that. Um, as it turns out, um, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in about 930 BC, you remember there was civil war in Israel. Um, and the north and the south split, Judah in the south, the kingdom of Israel in the north. Um, the kingdom of Israel never had a good king. They were all evil, wicked kings in all their history. Judah had some good kings once in a while, but also some bad kings. But um, one of the things that is noteworthy after this uh, civil war, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, maybe you remember that, uh, you know, not far from Solomon, that's when this civil war happened um, and split the nation. Um, Jeroboam in the north started doing something that would send the trajectory of the north into a real bad situation. They started embracing idol worship. Remember Jeroboam, he, um, he made two places of worship, one in Dan, up at the very north, um, uh, uh, the northern blue tip there, um, and then one also in Bethel, which is down toward the south part of the blue part of that kingdom. And he made two places of worship. Did anybody remember what, what did he make to have the people come and worship uh, uh, in those places? Yeah, somebody said it, golden calves. Does that work out good for Israel, worshiping golden calves? Uh, never did, but that's what he did. So at Bethel and Dan, they made golden calves, little places of worship. Uh, you know, they said, you don't need to go down to Jerusalem uh, to our enemy's territory to worship God. You can just worship our gods up here. And, and so Jeroboam sent them on a trajectory that was not great. Well, fast forward from 930 when that, uh, the kingdoms were divided. Um, there was a, a city that was being developed by a, a guy named Omri. Um, he began to work on and build a city called Samaria. Uh, the city of Samaria. Um, and Omri didn't finish his vision of that city. Um, a king in Israel would uh, take that, King Ahab. And maybe you remember King Ahab. He was not a nice guy, uh, along with Jezebel. It's quite a notorious time in Israel's history. But in 18, 874 to 853, um, finally, uh, Ahab finishes um, the city of Samaria and it became the capital city of Israel, the Northern 10 tribes. So it was a big deal the city of Samaria. Well, one of the things that happens when the Jews, the Lord promised, if you guys keep my statutes, commandments, judgments, you know, and, and have no other gods, I will protect you. I will bless you. I will be your God. You'll be my people. 
But God also said, but if you worship other gods and do your own thing, I'm gonna lift my hand of protection from off of you and you're on your own, good luck. Now, the Bible is really clear on this. Well, you know, the, the Northern tribes, they were so uh, against worshiping the true and living God and worshiping idols was their thing. Um, the Lord lifted up their hand. And so 722 marks a very important date. The Assyrian empire was very powerful. They were the big power at that time. And they came down and crushed the Northern kingdom, the, the 10 Northern tribes. They didn't crush Judah and the, the South there, but just the Northern 10. And what happened in 722, um, the Jews, um, it was a brutal thing. The Assyrians at that time were known for being extremely brutal. They would go in, conquer a city, kill most people. They would take the leaders of that city and do stuff like stand them in front of everybody and skin them alive and then take their skins and fly them like flags uh, in front of the city to remind anybody, don't mess with the Assyrians. It was horrifying. Um, skulls piled up outside of the city of their enemies, the Assyrians. So, so the Assyrians did that to the Jews there in the north. And, and some of those Jews, the Bible even tells us, they put hooks in the noses of those people and chained them together and brought them in as slaves there in um, Assyria. There was a small remnant of Jews that stayed in that region. But as it turns out, um, there was a king who came from the Assyrian uh, thing, a king named Sargon. Now you're thinking, Brett, are we talking Lord of the Rings? No, uh, it's like Lord of the Rings. Uh, the story is pretty radical. But Sargon, we read actually in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, it says, the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, from Huta, uh, from Ava, from Hamat, and from uh, uh, Sepharvaim, uh, and placed them there in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Um, so um, it was kind of a uh, sort of a colonization, uh, a colonist of foreign people coming into that region, Assyrian people. So if you were one of the remnant of the Jewish people living in that region during that time, um, that you would, you would actually uh, have to assimilate and mix with the Assyrians and become part of their culture and part of their pe people, or you'd be ki killed or dragged off with a hook in your nose into Assyria. So that was the people, they were compromised. The Jews there in the, the, that region of Samaria, they were compromised. And they somewhat tried to practice Judaism, but sort of. They actually had a, a version of the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. They had a tweaked version, kind of like, you know, the Book of Mormon sort of tweaked the, the, the true Bible. They sort of did that with the Pentateuch. And the, the Samaritans came up with sort of their twisted, compromised view or version of Judaism. But they also integrated some of the pagan worship of the Assyrians. And so they became sort of a half Jewish, half pagan Assyrian group of people. Um, and this was not good for those people. And, and by the way, what do you think the Lord thought of that, that these people were worshiping other gods along with trying to do sort of a Judaism kind of thing. Well, the Bible tells us, in fact, the next verse right after this in, in 2 Kings 17, 25, and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. You say, what's the deal? That sounds like, you know, is this Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers or bears or whatever, am I, uh, like what's going on here? Well, it's, it's true. What's really cool about this one, this, you, you see that uh, stone cutting uh, art that I've put up there? That's actually literally uh, archeologically dug up in Assyria, depicting the time when there was this influx of lions who came and attacked that region. And there's actual stories on stone about all these lions that were down at that time. Now, by the way, Israel uh, used to have lions and bears, uh, but they don't have them anymore. They're all gone now. But in those days, uh, you say, well, what's the deal? Why don't they just get a zoo uh, or whatever? You gotta remember, they didn't have, you know, uh, a 300 wind mag uh, to deal with a lion. Uh, you, at the most, you'd have a kind of a tweaked little bow, of an, bow and arrow. And you uh, bow hunters know, if you're gonna shoot a lion with a stick with a pointy tip, you better be really good at what you're doing. Uh, and like, it was, it, was a, it was a problem. People were dying because of all these lions. This was what the Lord, he lifted his hand of protection and said, you guys are on your own. So lions come and the Assyrians come, really a bad scene. Well, uh, some might say, well, Brett, that doesn't seem like a very loving God to send lions among their people. Um, but what isn't loving is if God would have allowed these people to keep doing what they were doing. 
Uh, they were doing horrific things, sacrificing humans on altars, sacrificing babies on altars. That's what these people were doing. And God said, I, I'm done with that. So in his mercy and grace, I think he started uh, dealing with these people. Well, the Jews mixed with the Assyrians and that sort of half-breed mix of people, they, they became what is known as the Samaritan people. Um, and they were hated by the Jews for so many reasons. If we go back to our timeline, so the Assyrians came down in 722, um, but um, the Jews in this time, um, they, 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 even though they were trying to be sort of Assyrian and Jew, they also um, hired uh, some priests to sort of help carry out their sort of Jewish, uh, weird, tweaked out religion. Interesting side note, did you know that there's Samaritan people in Israel to this day that once a year go up on the mountains of Samaria and still worship the same exact religion that they did back seven, you know, uh, 1700 or uh, 2,700 years ago, uh, which is shocking. Uh, you can see it on the news. Here's some pictures of, um, of Samaritans today that it looks like they're holding up the Torah, you know, like a Jewish thing, but that's the tweaked Torah. Uh, that's not the, the real Jewish one. Well, all that to say, um, that they just kind of dug in and became sort of a people known as the Samaritans. Later, of course, the, the, the north and the south, the two kingdoms, later they would be attacked by the Babylonians in 586 BC, led by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and they'd all be you know, taken off into captivity with just a tiny spattering of Samaritans and Jews that would be left in the land. But what's interesting, of course, 70 years later, the Jews were allowed to go back to Judah and Jerusalem, but also some of the Samaritans went back to that region and also the Samaritans started building up their kingdom. Sort of at the same time, the Jews were building up their kingdom. So fast forward, the Samaritans start getting stronger in the North and they actually build a temple um, on Mount Gerizim, which is in the middle of Samaria. Mount Gerizim, and they build that. Now this is a picture of the archeological ruin of that temple that sits on that mountain today. In fact, uh, last time I was there, I took my iPhone and snapped some of these shots of the archeological ruin of, of the temple on Mount Gerizim. It it's overlooks that region of Samaria. Um, uh, Micah was with me. We shot some video up there. Um, I want you to kind of get a feel. This is the top of that mountain where that temple where the Samaritans worshiped their God and gods from the Assyrian empire. Um, now, um, the Samaritans, they started pushing that their temple was the real one and the Jews' temple in Jerusalem was the fake one. And they made that case and the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other all the more when that happened. You had the temple in Jerusalem, you had the temple in, in Gerizim, Mount Zion, Mount Gerizim. And the big debate for, for actually centuries was which temple is the real one. Now we know because of the Bible and God's word that uh, the temple in Jerusalem was God's temple. Um, but as, as, as I was up there, I was just kind of struck with this, seeing this massive temple and what they had built uh, in 450 BC. That's when they built this temple. Um, as it turns out, um, that poser temple, uh, the fake one, um, the Samaritan one, uh, becomes part of our story today. So that's, uh, you might say, why are we talking about this? Well, the Jews, not only taught that their temple was not right, but from 450 BC um, and onward, the, it became really a hated group of people. The Samaritans hated the Samaritans because of the compromise, because they were sort of a half breed. It was a racist, but it was also a religion kind of problem that these people had. Uh, racial, religiously divided, angry, uh, sounds like a fun place to live, kind of like Portland. Anyway, um, God, uh, <laughs> God, uh, is gonna judge this area. But what's interesting is it, it, after 450 BC, if you recall, um, Antiochus Epiphanes comes down the Assyrian and does a kind of a reconquering around 170-ish uh, BC and kind of reconquers that whole area. Um, and the Samaritans took a hit, but the Jews took a big hit in Jerusalem from the uh, Antiochus. Maybe you remember that uh, Festival of Lights, the Maccabean Revolt. We've talked about that before. Well, the Maccabees, uh, Judas Maccabeus, his name means the hammer. Uh, he comes along and crushes the Assyrian Antiochus Epiphanes. Suddenly the Jews now are the, the, the strong people of that region. And so shortly after the Maccabean Revolt, you know, the Festival of Lights and Hanukkah, the Maccabees said, oh, now's our chance to crush the Samaritans. And so the Maccabees went and crushed the temple uh, on Mount Gerizim of the uh, Samaritans in 130 BC. Some people say it was 110, 
BC. It depends on who you're reading and what have you, but that, it's right around that time period. Well, um, so, so the, their temple's in ruin because of the Maccabees, but the Samaritans were still strong, but not as strong as the Jews. By this time, the Roman Empire was starting to come in and the Romans ended up subduing the, the, the Jews and they would rule uh, Israel for hundreds of years, the Romans. But it's kind of interesting, the way it all shook out is the Romans controlled the Jews, but the Jews still controlled the Samaritans. That's kind of how it worked out. And so the, the Samaritans really uh, were kind of, uh, re, re, they resented the Jews and their oppression against them uh, and what have you. Fast forward now to the time of Jesus. The, the Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Um, there was violence between them sometimes, even uh, during the time of Christ in the first century. Um, and that's where we pick up our story here in John chapter four. Sorry about all that history, but I think you'll see how it plays in here uh, today in our story. It says in John chapter four, verse one. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now pause here for a second. Um, this starts to give gravity to what we just read. The King James, he must needs go through Samaria. Does that seem like weird language? Uh, shouldn't you say, we really should go through Samaria? Um, kind of, but the implication here is this is unusual. This would have not been the ordinary statement. They would say, we need to go to Galilee, but whatever you do, don't go through Samaria to get to Galilee. <laughs> Why? Because Jews didn't go in Samaria. They stayed out of that. Remember that red box of the map? They stayed out of that. So if you're going to go up to the north, you would take a circuitous route. Uh, by the way, uh, there's some Jews in, in modern day uh, academia that's trying to argue the historically, people are always trying to rewrite history. I, I find this really interesting. Um, but some of the professors, you know, from Hebrew University are saying, uh, you know, uh, the Jews never hated the Samaritans. We were always friendly toward the Samaritans. Um, that's just not true. Um, well, what about the New Testament? Well, those guys say, we don't believe the New Testament. So it's, it's not the, that's not their way. But the New Testament and everything else in history tells us that. In fact, um, this, this is an interesting uh, part of, the, uh, of a, a scholarly work, a survey of the New Testament. Um, uh, they wrote it this way. One main road led from Jerusalem past Bethany to Jericho, then north up the Jordan Valley and, and uh, the west side of the Sea of Galilee toward Capernaum to avoid Samaria, um, whose inhabitants the Jews despised. Jews often traveled this road in going between Galilee and Judea. You say, well, big deal. So they took a different road. It was a big deal. Here's why. If you went straight through Samaria, that's a two-day journey. If you took this road that all the Jews took to go to Galilee from Jerusalem, it takes you six days. Um, it, it's really kind of like, uh, we're gonna go to Los Angeles. Well, how are you gonna get there? Well, we're gonna go through Utah and Arizona and down, to, and then we'll come back through. Like, like you'd say, that, that, that's a long trip. That's exactly what these guys did. Only they were walking with their feet or on, you know, on riding donkeys. Uh, so uh, that's kind of interesting that the Jews felt that strongly about staying out of that region. So the Jews, um, um, why is Jesus now saying, I need to go through Samaria? The, the, the disciples would have thought, or anybody listening would have thought, you're gonna do what? Like that's how ridiculous it would have been. But why did Jesus wanna go through Samaria? Was it because he was in a hurry to get to Galilee? Let's take a shortcut and go through Samaria. Well, one thing I, I don't think about Jesus is I don't think he was in a hurry. In fact, we never see Jesus in a hurry. Have you ever noticed that? He's always Mr. Chill. Uh, not in a hurry to get to any place. Uh, and he knew exactly what he was doing. So I don't think it was to speedily get to Galilee. I believe the reason Jesus actually was gonna go through there is um, not to get faster, but he had a divine appointment in a city of Samaria to meet a young woman uh, uh, who uh, he was gonna minister to, a divine appointment. And it's this beautiful story right before us. So we pick it up here in verse five. Um, it says, then, verse five, cometh he into a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, to, uh, near to the, the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. 
uh, interesting here. So, um, uh, you know, we know that Jesus gets tired. That's something that we learn here. D did Jesus get tired? Uh, he was God in the flesh. Surely he gave himself a shot of, you know, uh, testosterone or booster, you know, enhancing drugs or whatever, right? Nope, he got tired just like you and me. Um, that's an important thing. Remember Hebrews 4.15, it says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be um, touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's, that's a double negative, by the way. You might say, Jesus felt everything you've ever felt and everything everybody else in the world has ever felt. Um, and it says, but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So Jesus knew what it felt like to be tired uh, and, th and then some. So Jesus, that's kind of an interesting little phrase there. Jesus was weary. So he sat down on a well. Which well? Shockingly, this is Jacob's well. Um, what, what well is that? Well, you gotta remember centuries earlier, one of the patriarchs of the Jews, there was Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob dug a well and, uh, and, and that's the well Jesus is at. So it's kind of a famous well. Uh, it'd be like if you went to Virginia and went to George Washington's, uh, you know, um, a house or whatever. He's like, this is kind of part of our history. Uh, well, that's what, they, that, that's what they're doing. Jesus is at this kind of famous well. And, and there's another thing that's noteworthy. What time of day was it? Well, it says here uh, being about the sixth hour. Um, so so what, what time is that? Well, there's a debate on this and it's a hard one. Whenever you have the hour mentioned in the Bible, depending on what translation you have, modern or old, King Jimmy or whichever one you use, um, you'll have different times. Usually it's an argument between two. Um, and it has to do with which time system. Were they using the Jewish time system or the Roman time system? Um, you say, well, why did they have two systems? Um, because the Jews didn't like the Romans and they said, we're not using the Roman time system. Um, the Romans said the Jews are nothing, so we're not gonna use their time system. So um, it'd be like if today, you know, there's an argument, should we do daylight savings time or not? Let's say half the country says, we're gonna keep daylight savings time. And the other half says, we're not going to keep it. And so we write books and send letters and have appointments. It'd be a mess because you wouldn't know, are you using daylight savings time or not? Um, well, that's the way it was for the Jews. So in the Bible, sometimes the biblical writers use the Roman time. And sometimes the biblical writers use the Jewish time and it's a little confusing. So what, what's, who cares, Brett, what time of day it is? This, this is important. The thing that's mostly important is we know for sure it wasn't the morning time. Um, you know, the Jewish, uh, cal the Jewish time system would say that the sixth hour is 12 o'clock noon. Uh, the Roman time would say it's at six o'clock p.m. So we know it's from noon on when Jesus meets this woman. That's important and here's why. Uh, there's a great book uh, called Manners and Customs of the Bible, scholarly work on things that we don't know about because we don't live over there, especially in the first century. But one of the things that was kind of common of those days is, you know, you'd go in the morning in the cool of the day to get your water from the well in the town. But it was also a social event. People would come and check in on each other. The, the town leaders would come and talk about what they need to talk about. They'd help each other draw water out of the well. It was kind of a thing. Um, but that was the time when you draw water for the day uh, and what was heading and it would get you through the rest of the day. But they wouldn't let the, um, the people there that were uh, low lifes or re rejects or uh, outcasts, those people would come at a different time. And when would they be allowed to go to the well? Uh, during the heat of the day. Um, that's when they would let them go. If you were a tax collector and you were hated, you could go get your water in the heat of the day. Or if you were a prostitute, or if you were a thief or a, a, for a criminal uh, that was convicted at one point or something like that, they, they, they never let just your average person go to the well in the morning uh, un, un, unless they were of good reputation. It was kind of a societal hierarchy. Uh, by the way, that still happens today uh, with schools today, what schools people can go to or work that you could do or, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. So that's noteworthy. Jesus comes to the well and it's minimally at noon, which tells us something probably of the woman that he's about to meet. Let's take a look. Verse seven goes on. It says, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. Verse eight, for the, his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Question, how many disciples does it take to go grocery shopping? The answer, all of them. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, this is gonna be really funny. This is part of the story. The disciples are gone at Wilco or whatever, and Jesus 
is, <laughs> is here at the well and this woman walks up and he doesn't have anything to draw water with. So he says, um, woman, would, he's not being mean or saying, woman, give me some water. He, he's, he's being nice, but he says, give me something to drink. Um, now, uh, how does the woman respond? Look at verse nine, it says, and then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, this woman, she's shocked. This blows her away that she sees this Jew. And, and let me just say, she's not calling him a Jew like lovingly. How's it that you, Jew? Like, like they did not like the Jews either. How's it you being a Jew? And by the way, Jesus was not just your ordinary Jew. There's probably signs that Jesus, by some of the clothes he was wearing and what have you, that he was a rabbi. Um, he, and, and I'm sure she saw that he was not just any old Jew. There was something about him that he was kind of a Jew's Jew. Um, and say, how's it that you being a Jew? Strike one, talk to me, a woman. Strike two, women were treated horribly in that day, let alone, I'm a woman of Samaria, Let's strike three. Like, that's why she's so shocked. This was so ridiculous that a Jew would not only come and talk to her or even come near to her. Um, by the way, the Jewish rabbis taught that a Samaritan woman was uh, 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 defiled her whole life. There was no way to save her. She was lost cause, basically fuel for the fire of hell. And um, that's what the rabbis taught wrongly, but that's what they taught. Jesus is shattering the norms of the day by doing a bunch of stuff. Going through Samaria, totally going against the rules. Uh, Man-made rules, by the way. Um, uh, and he's also you know, risking destroying his reputation by doing this. Um, did Jesus really care about his reputation? Uh, Philippians 2 said, he made himself of no reputation. It took upon himself the form of a servant. You see, I think this woman, she's an outcast of the community because she's there at noon. We're gonna learn more about her. If you don't believe me on that, fine. But there's gonna be plenty of evidence that she's, she's not a really upstanding citizen, especially in those days. And you'll see why here in a second. But, um, but this is how outcast people feel. I think, when they see a normal squared away person that comes and ministers and talks to them, how is it that you are talking to me? Um, and Jesus is gonna be kind to this woman. He's gonna be loving to this woman, which is gonna blow her, blow her mind. Um, I wonder if sometimes we as Christians are not like Jesus. Well, I say, well, well WWJD, um, what would Jesus do? Well, let's, th let's say this. What, what would Jesus do if he was walking in downtown Portland and, and walked up to a prostitute? How would he treat her? What would he do? How would you treat her? And what would you do? Um, well, I, I kind of like what Jesus says. If you want to know the answer to that question, you just keep reading John chapter four. Because it's very likely this woman was a prostitute. And Jesus is going to treat her with kindness He's not gonna be condemning. This is an amazing story and it's something that should be a little bit of a splash of cold water on us, especially those that are sanctimonious, self-righteous uh, Christians looking down our pious noses at people that are sinners. What does Jesus do? Um, well, let's keep reading. You know, she says, how is it that you Jew be, uh, talking to me, a woman of Samaria? Uh, you guys don't deal with us. And then Jesus, this is where he starts getting deep. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him and he would have given thee living water. Um, Jesus brings up something that's kind of new here, living water. What is that? Living water. Oh, why speak so cryptic? Jesus is hinting at for this woman what he's willing to do. Um, if you'd only ask, I've got a gift. That's what he's saying. Um, if you ask, I've got a gift from God, but it re it'll require some stuff of her first. But Jesus brings up this idea of living water. Um, that's, we know what that is as Christians. If you read your Bible, living water really speaks of everlasting life. In fact, Jesus is gonna go in more into it here in a minute and give some more definition to this idea of living water. But it is kind of what it sounds like. Living water versus dead water. I remember when I was in Burkina Faso, Africa, and it's, it's, it's just south of the Sahara Desert. Half the country's in the Sahara, um, and it's hot, really hot, and it's dry. But one thing you'll never see in Burkina Faso is Motlama Falls. 
In fact, you won't find a bubbling creek like we have all over Oregon. We got rivers and creeks and water, cold, icy, pure water trickling down the hillsides uh, everywhere. In Burkina Faso, you're lucky if you find a muddy mud puddle. If you find a well, it's gonna be a muddy well. Like, and, and it, like water's kind of a hard thing there. Um, it's, and I remember when I was there just thinking, boy, these poor people, that it's just hot and just water's not easily or readily available. In Oregon, man, I've got water everywhere. And, and it's living water. It's bubbling out of the ground here in Oregon. That's the difference. Um, the world offers the puddle of water, but God offers living water. Which one are you gonna take? When I was in Burkina Faso, you'd see kids playing in mud puddles and, and I'd see the adults going, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. I'm like, why? It's, it's hot and there's, at least there's a little water. Um, can I tell you why they weren't supposed to do it? Um, because uh, there's these things called guinea worms in those mud puddles. There are these tiny little microorganisms in the water. And if the kids are playing, if they have a cut on their toe or a little uh, opening in their skin, these microorganisms go, will go into their skin and their blood system. And these little microorganisms, they grow to the, be these worms. Some of these worms get to be like two or three feet long inside their veins. They grow in the veins of these kids. It's so sad. And then, and then the kid starts feeling their legs starts to ache and then they wonder what's going on and they, they probably have a guinea worm. And how do they know? Well, the guinea worm, when it gets the length, it starts to want to come out. So it starts to surface on your skin and you find like a blister on your leg. That blister eventually pops like a zit and the head of the worm pops out. You guys look a little queasy. Like what's wrong with you guys? Por oh, Portlandia, that's right. Sorry, let me finish though. <laughs> so the head pops out, but you better not pull on it because if you pull it, you'll break the head off and then it'll die inside your leg and cause horrible infection. That's why they call them fire worms also because it makes your leg feel like it's on fire. So what do you do to get the worm out? This is true. You can look this up. I'm not making this up. I saw kids with this on their leg. They would take a stick or a little pencil or something and they would take the head and wind it around the pencil and then tape the pencil to their leg. The next morning, you just wind it up a little bit more and then tape it. And it only took like two weeks or so. Um, and you just keep winding and eventually the two or three feet of worm comes out. It's all wound up on the pencil and then snap comes out and everything's good. You're good to go. Now you're saying, Brent, why did you tell us that story? <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Can I just say, you will either drink of the living water that God gives you, or you'll drink of the water of this world. And the water of this world is just a mud puddle comparatively. And it's full of guinea worms. Sin, man, it just it overpromises and underdelivers. You know, Jeremiah touched on this subject in Jeremiah chapter two, when he said there in verse 13, speaking God's word, God says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's what Jesus is talking about, living waters. And what did they do instead? They exchanged the living water, the fountain, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They'd hew out stones that they would hopefully collect rainwater and store the water in those cisterns. But those stones, because of earthquakes and whatever, they would break and crack and then they wouldn't hold any water anymore. They became worthless. Jeremiah is saying, the Lord, thus saith the Lord, you've forsaken the living water for just a, a broken down cistern that doesn't actually feed you water. This woman, she's gonna learn, what did she come to the well for? She brought her water pot and she was gonna fill it up with water. Jesus is gonna use that as an analogy. Do you understand a gift that I wanna give you? If you ask, I'll give you this living water. And that's what he says to her. Well, verse 11, she starts to change her tone just a smidge. Before she's like, how is it that you Jew are talking to me, a woman of Samaria? Now she says, verse 11, the woman said unto him, sir. <laughs> Notice a little respect there now. She probably senses something special about what he just said. Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Now, before Jesus answers that, Jesus could say, yes, I am greater than Jacob, a lot greater. See, we know biblically Jacob was a weirdo. 
Um, oh, he's the patriarchal hero of these, you know, the Jews in those days. But remember, he was a lion, cheating, stealing, smooth man. What is a smooth man? Well, you got to read the Bible to figure that out. Um, but he was a, he was a, in, and then, you know, eventually he comes around and becomes Jacob turns to Israel. The, the Lord gives him a new name, that whole story. But Jacob was, was a great patriarch figure of the Jews, but compared to Jesus, the woman saying, I, by the way, I believe this woman here, she's sort of answering her own question. Um, I think, I think that, uh, she says, are you greater than Jacob? And I think in her mind, she's sensing there's some greatness that I'm perceiving here in this guy. And you can provide something better than Jacob's well right here. And Jesus is kind of obviously the answer is yes. Um, but check it out. Jesus answered her, verse 13, and said unto her, and now he's going to clarify what he's talking about. Whosoever drinketh of this water, probably pointing to the well, will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. See, now we're, we understand he's talking about salvation. Uh, it's, it's back to John three sixteen. We were in last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's what Jesus is talking about to all these people. But especially this woman as well, if you drink of this water, he's, he's talking about salvation. The living water is that which produces everlasting life. And you just, I gotta love this woman. She, she answers verse 15, the woman said unto him, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Oh man, now, now she's where she needs to be. I hope, I hope you've come to the place where you realize you need to be saved. I bet you this woman came to that well that day, just a normal day at the well, being an outcast with a bunch of sin piled up in her life, feeling like a loser. And suddenly Jesus is offering her a gift of salvation and eternal life. And she says, can I have this? So now she's asked for it. Just like she said, all you gotta do is ask. And now she's asking. Well, great, so she's saved now, right? Not yet, not so fast. You see, we're gonna see in this story a really essential part of understanding. Um, before the woman really can be saved, she's gotta do something to get to the place where she really can be saved. She's close right now, but there's still something she needs to do. Does anybody wanna take a stab at what she has to do now? Yes, there's a repentance. Now keep in mind, this is a beautiful example. Um, repentance doesn't save you. Can I just make that clear? Um, you could repent of your sins and still go to hell. What you need to do is repent of your sins. That means to change your mind, acknowledge your sins before God and know that you deserve death and hell. And God was right, we are wrong and we repent. That's, that's what gets you to that place where you can say, now that you know your need, now you can get the free gift. You're saved not by repentance, that's what gets you to a place of being ready to be saved. But once you confess with your mouth and believe, free gift from God, it's a gift through God, you're saved by grace through faith alone, not of your works, not of yourselves, the Bible says. So repentance is an act that you gotta do to get to that place where you're ready to be saved. So, so Jesus knows she's probably not there yet. And so what's he gonna do? Is he gonna say, by the way, woman, you're a horrible, wretched sinner. Do you agree with that? That's not the way Jesus handles that. I think I, I admire him for this. Let's see, how does Jesus bring the idea uh, of repentance to this woman? Uh, well, we pick it up here uh, in verse 16. So she already just asked, can I have some of that water? And Jesus said unto her, go call your husband and then come hither. Like go get your husband and then come back and then we'll talk. Um, now, now the woman is uh, got a predicament here because she, she's gonna have to answer him. Check out her answer. Quick thinking here, verse 17. The woman answered and said, uh, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, liar. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Uh, he could, that's, that's what some of us would have said. But Jesus said, I love the graciousness of Jesus. Notice that he says, thou hast well said, I have no husband. By the way, um, Jesus affirms her lie, sort of, in a way. Uh, what, what, what this, what's cool about this is, by the way, Philippians 1.10 says that, that you may approve that which is excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Um, that's, that's what this woman, you know, Jesus is gonna uh, let her sort of confess, but her confession is not really, it's technically right, I have no husband. And so Jesus says, oh, you've well said that you have no husband. But then he goes on, um, thou hast well said, verse 18, 
for thou hast five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. You see how nice Jesus is being here? Good job, you, you affirmed that you have no husband, because that's true, but you actually have had five husbands, and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. Boop. Suddenly she knows, uh, wow, this dude. In fact, we've seen the progression. She called him a Jew first. Now she calls him Sir twice. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir. And then also later on, uh, she says, verse 15, Sir, give me this water. But now she calls him what? Verse 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. And I'd say to her, good eye. He just told her all her sins. Like, you know, you, you know, you've been married five times and the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. So you've spoken rightly. She's like, I perceive thou art a prophet. So she went from Jew to sir to now he's a prophet. She's getting closer. Still not really right though. Jesus is not just some kind of prophet. Now, one thing I wanna say before we move on in this, how did Jesus know, and be careful on this one. How did Jesus know all those details about her life? Anybody? Yeah, that's kind of the obvious. Well, he's God, so he knows all things and the end. Yeah, I'll give you that and I'll agree with that. And I'm not gonna diminish from, the fact is Jesus is God in the flesh. I have no uh, desire to diminish that at all. But there is something that's kind of important to know here. When Jesus does a lot of the miracles and stuff, he always attributes it, even though he is God, um, does what part of the Godhead does he attribute the miracles that he does? What part of the Godhead does he attribute that to? The, the Spirit. Remember, he does things by the power of the Spirit. Now, this is important because the Trinity is a mystery, and I don't mean to get into all that today. But one of the things I want to remind you, there's, there's, there's so many neat things the Holy Spirit will do through his people, the church. The thing that bums me out so much is of all the things people like to talk about, about the Holy Spirit, what do you think the number one topic is when people in churches bring up the Holy Spirit? What's the first thing they bring up? Anybody? Tongues. Speaking in tongues. Do you speak in tongues? Are you, and people get all into, the, oh, are you a cessationist? Are you speaking in tongues? Are you not? And people get all up in a tizzy. Um, and I think that's so unfortunate. Why? Because tongues is the, well, how important is tongues when you measure up all the manifestations of the Holy Spirit? How important is it? Bible says it's the least of all the gifts. That's what it says. Paul said that, 1 Corinthians 14. And yet it gets all the press. In fact, I bet some of you in this room would have to be hard pressed to tell you what some of the other manifestations of the Holy Spirit are. And you know what's really a bummer? Is there, we know those are better than the speaking in tongues. And yet people don't even know what they are. One of those mysterious manifestations of the Holy Spirit is a thing called a word of knowledge listed there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that's one of the things the Holy Spirit can do for you. Have you ever been praying, Lord, give me the words to say, and I don't know what I'm doing. And, and then as you're talking, you just kind of have a sense in your heart and the Lord just gives you something to say, but, but it, it, you have a distinct impression that it didn't come from your brain somehow. Like I didn't even know that about that, but I'm saying it with my mouth. And you're like, what in the world just happened? I, there, there's several things, a word of prophecy, which by the way, that's not speaking the future. In the New Testament, a word of prophecy, read 1 Corinthians 14, it's to speak a word of edification, exhortation, and comfort. And man, we need people speaking words of prophecy in that way by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There's other ones that are neglected. For example, here's a giant one missing in the church today. Um, discernment, the discerning of spirits. Is this of God or is it not? Oh, how the church needs to be filled with the spirit and have the discerning of spirits. I, I'm shocked at what Christians say and do today thinking it's all okay, but they just have no discernment by the spirit. But this one here, I think this is a great example of how a word of knowledge looks like. Uh, Jesus just says, no, actually you have five husbands. The one you're with right now is not your husband. Um, did you know that the Lord could actually, now be careful if you're, if you're doing that, you better make sure it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I was a kid, the hippie days of our church, there was all these people walking around with words of knowledge, but I think they'd just been smoking a little too much weed, honestly. Um, and it was weird. Um, but, uh, but I do know that, that that is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. By the way, if you're interested, we did a teaching quite a few years ago, 1 Corinthians 12, on the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and how they work out. And man, what an important thing. Well, we see that here in John 4. Now, this, this woman, uh, can I just mention, she gives what I like to call a partial confession. Are you a partial confession kind of person? Um, where she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right, you're right, good job. 
but the one, you know, like, but he clarifies. Um, I, I have that happen, like even in counseling, like a guy will come and pastor, my marriage is not going well. Um, well, why is your marriage not going well? Because my wife really doesn't like me. She's not very nice to me. Oh, is there anything you need to tell me about like you or things you're, well, I mean, okay, I, I, I struggle with pornography uh, and I, I click away and, and my wife knows that. Oh, and you think that's gonna make your marriage, is there anything else you, you need to tell me? Well, okay, I'm having an affair with the secretary at work. Uh, oh, okay. Like this happens all the time, by the way. Uh, they started with my marriage is trouble and my wife doesn't like me. You've spoken well in saying your, your wife doesn't like you. <laughs> but actually you're looking at porn and you're having an affair at your work. And if I were your wife, I'd probably kill you, but I'm not your wife. Um, but but I, don't, I don't counsel like that, but it is tempting. Uh, the beginning, uh, you know, uh, of her confession is just kind of a partial confession. I have no husband, uh, but the Lord, he always knows. And by the way, if you're a unrepentant sinner and you're still in your sins and, you, and the Lord's saying, you know, is there something you need to tell me? Don't forget the Lord knows everything about you. And he's seen, you know, all your sins are open to him. He, he, there's, it's not a surprise to him. So we need to get to this place of total confession. Now, Jesus is gracious with her and, and he, he says, yeah, he calls her out. But, but um, as we read on, it gets really interesting because um, verse 19, she perceives that he's a prophet. And what's the first thing you do when you realize you're standing in front of a prophet? It's probably the same thing you do when you find out you're standing in front of a pastor. I hate that part of being a pastor. When I'm at the gas station, what do you do for a living? Um, I wanna do kind of a partial confession, if you know what I mean. I'm a teacher. Uh, well, what do you teach? <laughs> Ancient literature? Uh, like, <laughs> no, I, because I'll tell you, as soon as I tell the gas station guy, well, you know, I'm a pastor. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Puts a cigarette out real quick, you know, it's like. Um, and, and, then, and then right after that always comes the deflecting Bible question. Did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> or did, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Uh, like, why do people do those questions? I think they're deflecting to make sure whatever I do as a man of the cloth, that I don't get into some thing. I am tempted once they start pushing that button, I am tempted to say, um, before I ask you about Adam's belly button, um, at what point in your life did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Like, like that is tempting. So, uh, you know, but it is funny. This is, this is I used to think, and, and I'm changing my view on this, but I used to think this woman does that classic thing. Oh, I think you're a prophet. And now she's gonna ask the Bible question of the day. And I thought it was a deflection, but you, you, you check it out. I'll show you what I mean. So remember, Samaritan and a Jew sitting there talking, which is odd. She said, our fathers, Samaritans, worshiped in this mountain. Does anybody remember the name of that mountain? Mount Gerizim. That's the mountain she's talking about, the one we went over all the history of, where the temple was built and all that stuff. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you, Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She's asking the, the old question, which mountain is right? Mount Zion with the temple in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, the temple is right? Which one of us are right since you're a prophet? And I used to think this was a deflection, but in seeing the story and kind of trying to discern this woman's heart, she says, oh, I want to drink of this water. Well, go get your husband. Jesus says not to be mean, but to have her get to a place of repentance. And then what happens? This is important. She says, well, then which temple's the right temple? I wonder if maybe this woman is saying, I wanna make my sins right. And in those days, before Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave and ascended into heaven, you would go to the temple to deal with your sinful stuff. I wonder if this woman is at a place of real repentance saying, okay, I, I wanna make it right. So which temple's the right one to go to? I think there's something to that. And especially when you see Jesus's answer. It says in verse 21, then Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Um, that hour, has it come yet? It has for us, not for her, but it has for us. Because guess what? We don't worship. You and I, aren't worship, we worshiped at Athey Crick this morning. You didn't worship in Jerusalem, did you? Why? Because this hour's come when people will worship the Father, which we did this morning in Portland. You know, verse, uh, verse 22, I love this. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, let me talk about this. Sometimes I've noticed Christians 
in the, with the hope of saving souls, they'll sort of um, throw, throw their doctrine card out the window because they wanna be loving and accepting of all people and not saying things that are pointed or prickly. So they kind of throw the doctrine out the window. Jesus doesn't do that. She's saying, which mountain is it? And Jesus doesn't pull bunches. He's saying, you, you Samaritans, you don't even know what you're doing when it comes to worship. And he's clear on that. And then he says, and the Jews, he says, um, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now this, this statement that he makes is different than what Jews were actually saying at that day. This, the Jews were preaching sal salvation is for the Jews only. Jesus is saying something different. He's not saying salvation is for the Jews only. He's saying salvation is of the Jews. What does he mean? It's just true. Genesis chapter 12, when God said, I'm gonna bless you, Abraham, and the nation of Israel, the Jews, I'm gonna bless you. And all the nations of the world will be blessed by your people, the Jews. How is that gonna work out practically? Well, a Jew, Jesus, would die for the sins of the whole world and save the world from its sins through the Jewish people. Jesus is really tying that all together, saying salvation is not for the Jews only, but he says that salvation is of the Jews. Um, this is a huge part. So it's not as much now gonna be the place, but it's gonna be the person. Check this out as he goes on. He says, verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, this is powerful. We could spend a week just on this. But how are we to worship? In spirit and in truth. Some churches are all about the spirit and not so much about the truth. Some churches are all about the truth, but not so much about the spirit. They're the chosen frozen, you know? So you got your charismaniacs and you got your frozen chosen. Be careful because I think the Lord wants us to be worshiping in spirit, not, not uh, quenching the spirit and the working of the spirit, but he also wants us to worship in truth. Jesus is modeling that even right now when he's talking about uh, worship how we're gonna worship. The true seeker is not a person, it's the Father in heaven. The Father seeks such to worship God. So all that to say, um, a lot of times churches get it backwards. We, we're all about the seekers, the people, and make them feel comfortable and don't say anything controversial and make sure they feel welcome in our church, uh, but we're not willing to speak the truth anymore. And that's not working for the church today. I've found that the churches that have the spirit alive and well, which you gotta find a church with the spirits moving, but also have a lot of truth coming out. You need that too. And if you don't have both of those components, I'd say find another church. That's really important. Well, we'll perhaps get into this more on Wednesday night. Verse 25, this makes the woman think, boy, this guy's deep. It makes me think of the Messiah. I think that's what she's thinking, because check it out. In verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now here's the, the mic drop moment of the day. Verse 26, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am. Am what? Well, notice the word he is in italics there, which means it wasn't in the original text. I believe that's important. I think the translators were well-meaning by throwing the word he in there. But um, this idea, by the way, scholars call it the ego emi statement of the New Testament Greek, where it's Jesus superimposing himself over the I am of Exodus chapter, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20 um, and chapter 12, you know, all, um, all these areas. It's interesting where God, you know, remember Charlton Heston, I am that I am, the burning bush and the, all that. Um, what's the I am? You know, Moses would have said, you are what? But do you understand? Jesus answers that question. And here Jesus says, I that speaketh to the am. And he, he would say this over again, and then he'd fill in the blanks over and over. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of the life. I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheepfold. Like on and on, Jesus goes talking about all the I am's that he is. He fills in that blank for us. So she said, I think there's gonna be a Messiah come and he's gonna, I think she's saying this because she's like wondering if this might just be the Messiah. So she says that and then Jesus confirms I that speak to thee am. Now, mic drop moment, and now we got a funny moment. What happens next? The disciples come stumbling up with their Wilco bags, <laughs> and they see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. Ah! Check this out, look, look at verse 27. 
And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? <laughs> I could just see it, Peter going to John. Doesn't he know, didn't he get the memo? You don't talk to a Samaritan woman. And John's like, I'm not gonna say anything. You say, something. I'm not gonna say anything. Like they said nothing wisely because Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. But the point that you gotta understand is the disciples are like, somebody should have given Jesus the memo that you don't go talking to some horribly defiled Samaritan woman. That's the idea. But here's Jesus making friends and sharing salvation, the water of life with this poor woman. I love this, beautiful story. Lord forbid that we be like the disciples stuck in our cultural traditions of not liking people or being racial or uh, hatred because of sinners and stuff like that. Jesus is blowing the doors off of all that. We'll check it out. Um, then it says, um, verse 27, uh, par pardon me, verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. The very thing she came for, fill her water pot, she's now forgot about that. That doesn't matter anymore. I love, she leaves her water pot because she found the, the answer to life. Uh, like that's such a beautiful picture. She left her water pot, went her way into the city. Now this is where it gets funny again, because remember she's been married to five men um, and she's living with a guy that's not her husband. In those days, that was, you were pretty much a prostitute if that was going on. They, they, they would consider that uh, prostitution. So here's this woman and what does she do? She goes into the city and talks to all the men of the city. And what does she say? She said to the men, verse 28, verse 29, come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Do you think there were some nervous dudes going, everything that you ever did? Everything. So all the men of the city, it says, verse, uh, verse 30, then they all went out uh, of the city and came to Jesus. And can I just say, if you're like, like you know, what did Jesus do with the prostitute? He was kind and merciful, forgiving, um, saving her from her sins. Um, I wonder what Jesus would do with the perverted men that were uh, horrible guys that probably slept with her or abused her or whatever. In the same way, I think Jesus would be loving and forgiving to them if they repent of their sin. Um, this is what the Lord does for all of us. And, and, and I end with this this morning, is if you are an old sinner who's been forgiven, you repented of your sin and you've been saved, just be so glad. We are the woman at the well. We're the one that's the outcast and the sinful person and Jesus knows all our sins, but the Lord loves us and forgives us and we can drink of the living water and have everlasting life. And if you're an old timer Christian, don't, don't ever get jaded and don't forget not to be, um, you know, we don't, we don't wink at sin and <clears throat> we still know that sin is bad, but we don't be judgy and critical and mean spirited toward the sinner. We should be loving for it's the goodness of the Lord, Romans chapter two, verse four, that leadeth men to repentance. And the Lord's love is great toward those that are broken, outcast, messed up sinners. And we should remember that. Um, but the second thing, not only you old timer Christians be rejoicing in this story, but also if you're a sinner still in your sins and you've not been saved and you have yet to drink of the water of life, Jesus would offer to you the same exact offering, the gift that he talked about in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God, Paul said, you know, that um, our sin, you know, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That gift is being offered to you to accept Jesus Christ as your savior. Can I urge you to drink of the living water? You can drink from a mud puddle with guinea worms. That's what sin and the world offers and it's painful. Or you can drink of the water of life, the bubbling, beautiful fountain of life that comes from Jesus. It's up to you. Let's pray together. And Lord, how thankful we are uh, for just the good news of the gospel. Um, just seeing how it was given to this Samaritan woman and the, the um, brutal history behind her story. And yet how you just came and loved on her and saved her. How thankful we are that you're able, even as your word says, to save even to the uttermost, to the furthest out person that's in debauchery and sin. Even out there, you're able to save and, and forgive. So Lord, I pray that no one would go away from this service, whether they're here in the building or watching online without repenting of their sins and then confessing with their mouth their belief in Jesus. For by grace, we're saved through faith. May that be true of many today. And, and for those of us that are saved, may we go away rejoicing in Jesus' name, amen.